well, welcome, welcome everybody. We're really happy to see you all here. Uh, David is going to be talking about strategies to minimize cancer risk, which is a really important topic since we're only seeing cancer incidence increase over time. There's lots of reasons for that and lots of treatments available, and David's going to talk about that. Um, David Lerner um, is an acupuncturist and a nutritionist, um, and he's been practicing for probably about 18 years now. 19. 19 <laughs> years now. So we've got a lot of great knowledge on the subject. Um, and like I said, we practice over there at Kirk Center for Integrative Medicine. And David and I work as a team, um, uh, on our, especially on our uh, integrative uh, cancer patients, um, but on um, <clears throat> autoimmunity and um, hypertension and a whole bunch of different issues that we approach together from a functional medicine perspective. And it's a lot of fun to work with David. So, I'm especially excited to, uh, to hear him talk tonight. Thanks, David. <laughs> He's the best place to work with. Uh, yeah, we make a really good team. Um, so, um, uh, my background, um, I'm a licensed acupuncturist, like, like Evan was saying. Um, I started training in 1996 with a herbalist named Isaac Cohen, um, who came to teach in Seattle, and uh, he specialized in treating breast cancer with Chinese medicine and Chinese herbs. And uh, he started; he would get uh, calls from patients in Seattle. He was in Northern California, and he would start referring them to me, and then he would work with me on the cases. Um, and then he, uh, and then I went to China in 1997, and he helped hook me up with a teacher of his at the Beijing Cancer Institute. Um, which is an interesting place because in China everybody gets conventional care, but they also get combined Chinese medical care at the same time. Mm -hmm. So they get this really nice combined treatment. It was really um, uh, interesting to study over there. Um, and then I, I worked with Isaac for a while and, and saw patients just pretty much doing Chinese medicine. And then uh, 2009 I went and studied with Donnie Ants. And Donnie's a very, very well respected uh, herbal nutritionist <coughs> in Ashland, Oregon. And uh, he runs, him and his wife Jan runs something called the Madeiras Foundation. Um, and he also works very closely with uh, an integrative oncologist named Dwight McKee, who's become one of my mentors as well. Um, uh, I did uh, two intensive trainings with Donnie, and then I have ongoing training with him. We, uh, we have a teleconference group that meets once a month and go over cases, and then we also have a very active uh, email dialogue. So, um, I feel very blessed and very well supported that in treating cancer patients, which is such a complex and difficult thing to do, I have this amazing wealth of knowledge behind me when I, when I, um, when I have questions, which I have all the time. Um, you know, uh, in general, I can't remember who I was talking to. Oh, Jennifer Nevin. I was talking to Jennifer the other day about how, um, how you know, just doing the work that we do, we're, we're, we're accepting a lifetime of never mastering what we do. And working with cancer, it's even more difficult, I think, because it's so complex and so in-depth, and, uh, uh, and there's so much to it. Um, a lot of these slides are from... Hey, come on. There's a, there's a hand up there. A lot of the slides are uh, uh, from a breast cancer talk that I did on breast cancer prevention. So you'll notice, like, um, a lot of pink, and you'll notice um, they're a little geared towards breast cancer, but that's fine. Um, this, this talk is uh, uh, geared towards anyone who uh, is looking to prevent getting cancer. Uh, anyone who has cancer currently, this is going to be very relevant for. And anyone who's had cancer and wants to minimize the chance of getting recurrence. Um, I have a lot of slides, so I may go through things, some things really, really quickly. So if you get frustrated with me doing that, just sort of trust that it will come together in the end and you're leaving with the notes. So kind of trust me that I don't want to, I want to make sure that the last 20 slides, which are very, very important, I don't run through quickly. So if you see me going through stuff quickly and you get frustrated, just, just remember that I said that there was, there was a method to my madness. Would you like questions? Um, you know, uh, if you feel like there's a question that's pertinent to what's going on at the moment, you can ask it. Uh, and at the same time, we'll have to see how that goes, because if I get too bogged down, we won't get through this. But we'll definitely have time for questions. Um, so a lot of what you're going to hear me talking about tonight is what I call terrain management, working with the biological terrain. What's the biological terrain? The biological terrain is the body. 
and um, this conventional biomedical model, what, you know, what conventional oncologists do, and I appreciate what conventional oncologists do, by the way. Um, I think there's a lot of problems in conventional oncology, but I'm really appreciative that conventional oncology exists because I don't have the tools to handle cancer once it's developed, and only conventional oncology does. And it can be done in a better way than it is, but uh, I, I, I'm not comfortable with the concept that we can handle cancer once it's developed with nutritional and alternative protocols. We can't. Um, in most cases. The conventional biomedical model is focused on the tumor and the cancer cells. Let's eradicate the cancer cells with surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. Um, the analogy that I like to use is a garden, and as far as the garden is concerned, oncologists are, are picking out weeds. So the weeds that are growing, they have to pull the weeds. Very necessary step. The holistic model is focusing on the terrain or the metabolic environment in the body and its interaction with the cancer cells the microenvironment around the cancer cells. Why are the weeds growing? What can we do to prevent the weeds from growing? Um, our therapy is to boast, boost the innate host resistance and modulate the terrain to remove metabolic factors that favor tumor proliferation and progression. Ideally, we bring all these together, which is the integrative approach, which combines evidence-based strategies from both, both models. And there are evidence-based strategies that we use, too. Pretty much everything that I'm going to talk about today is evidence-based. There's data on all of it. Um, basically, you know, what I'm trying to say in this slide is that cancer is a slow process. It's not something that happens quickly. On average, the process takes 8 to 10 years before breast cancer is detected from one cell that you can see it on a mammogram. 8 to 10 years. Um, which means that there was dysfunction going on for a long time before it was even diagnosed. Contributing factors for getting cancer that we know of, smoking, obesity, lack of physical activity, hormone, hormonal imbalances, stress, uh, genetic risk, and environmental toxin exposure. And these are the only ones we know of. Um, you know, I get a lot of patients who are very, very healthy who get cancer and they try to figure out why they got cancer and it's hard and we don't know. We just don't know. There's a lot of really seemingly healthy people that get cancer. Um, Robert Crayon was a really good example, was a very, very famous nutritionist who was a mentor to a lot of us. He died of colon cancer um, and he was a healthy guy and we don't know why. We, this is a disease we don't understand a lot about and we're all susceptible to it. David, you don't have diet listed there? Should be. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so this slide, basically, you know, we're talking here about um, women who immigrate to the United States from Asian countries uh, where the rates are four to seven times lower experience an 80% increase in risk of after living in the United States for a decade or longer. A generation mm -hmm. later, the risk for their daughters approaches that of U.S. born women. What's the saying? Breast cancer, A, is epidemic in the, in, the, in the United States, and B, it's clearly environmental. Cancer-causing genes are called oncogenes, genes that prevent cancer are called tumor suppressor genes. If a tumor suppressor gene is abnormally turned off, or an oncogene is turned on, then carcinogenesis is likely to occur. Epigenetics is something we hear a lot about nowadays. We didn't know a lot about it 10, 15 years ago. Epigenetics is a system that's designed to keep good genes running and suppress bad genes. This is the part that we can, we, we can control, epigenetics. That means lifestyle, dietary interventions can actually affect how DNA is expressed. 15 years ago, we didn't think this was possible, but we have a lot of data now saying that this is true. The study of food nutrients and their effect on disease through epigenetics is known as nutrigenomics and bioactive components in food can actually bind to certain transcription factors, influencing their ability to, to bind in the response elements and control to transcription. So what's it saying? Foods have a big effect on DNA, DNA expression and genetic transcription and how genes express. Let's go back to the terrain. Things that enhance the terrain, things that help the soil. Um, making sure we have optimal levels of micronutrients, vitamin D in particular, zinc and iodine, to name a few. Various botanicals, we're going to talk about these, curcumin, green tea, resveratrol, quercetin. 
from a breast cancer perspective, two hydroxy estrone or estrogens, which is a protective type of estrogen, exercise, a low glycemic, low sugar anti-inflammatory diet, liver support and antioxidants, and things that deplete the terrain, toxins, high sugar insulin, micronutrient deficiencies, elevated copper, low zinc, and, and what we consider to be bad estrogens, although I think that's simplistic, which are known as 16 hydrox, uh, hydroxyestrone and 4 hydroxyestrone estrogens. We're going to talk about those more later. 35% of all cancers are linked to diet. Estimates for women are as high as 50%. Simple lifestyle and behavior changes could reduce the U.S. death rates of cancer by 50%. Um, in 1988, a researcher named Harold Foster looked at 200 cases of what are called spontaneous regression of cancer, people who just, their cancer is cured, um, and he found that 87% of those patients, they made major dietary changes before they had this dramatic improvement, and these were his findings. These were foods eaten in highest quantities, the ones we kind of would think about for general health and as anti-cancer foods. They have a lot of active phytonutrients, and obviously foods that are kind of things we should be staying away from, like canned foods and commercially raised meats and, and white sugar. Um, the cruciferous vegetables, the brassica vegetables in particular, are really potent, really potent, uh, having anti -can breast cancer properties. Um, uh, this was a study that was done in Sweden looking at over 2,000 women. Women consuming 1.5 cups of brassica vegetables a day showed to have a 25% decreased risk of getting breast cancer. Um, and we know now that cruciferous vegetables are really high in a bunch of potent anti-cancer uh, nutrients. Uh, indols, isothiocyanate sulfurophans. They help with estrogen metabolism. They shunt metabolism of estrogen toward the protective estrogen away from the icky estrogen. Um, they have major anti-cancer properties. They promote what's called apoptosis, which is cancer cell death, where the cancer cells die on their own. They're really important for liver detoxification pathways. Um, and they help to increase a really important antioxidant called glutathione. And, uh, uh, glutathione is sort of the, the most important antioxidant in the body. Sulfurophanes in particular, one of the chemicals that we get from brassica is was discovered at Johns Hopkins University in 1992. And since then, there have been 500 papers written about it. Um, and it helps to upregulate glutathione. Probably the, one of the best things we can do to upregulate glutathione. Um, there's a naturopath named, uh, who owns Dunwoody Labs, which is a functional medicine lab in Georgia. And her name is Cheryl Burdett. You know Cheryl? Did you ever talk about her? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really, really sharp naturopathic physician. And her lab, a lot of what they do is testing on um, antioxidant levels. They're, they're probably the best lab in the country for testing antioxidant levels. And I went up to her and I said, hey, you know, like, uh, we have all these uh, uh, things we can do to help increase glutathione. What works the best? And she said, broccoli seed extract. She said, that's the thing they see the best results with in their clinic. How people who do broccoli seed extract um, uh, helps to increase glutathione. Uh, better than anything else they see. So great thing. Glutathione is a major, major important antioxidant, really important for detoxification pathways, major anti-cancer properties. Um, these chemicals are in the sprouts and seeds, in particular broccoli, also in Brussels sprouts and kale. Potent tra uh, transcription inducer phase two uh, liver detoxification enzymes and antioxidant enzymes. Um, going back to these estrogen metabolites, um, we do a test commonly here at, in the clinic um, called a complete hormone, urinary complete hormones test by Genova Diagnostics. Um, and it's not only looking at hormone levels, but it also looks at what are called the downstream metabolites of hormones. These aren't really ever looked at in conventional gynecology or ecology, so it's unlikely that your medical doctor, your conventional medical doctor, would know about these, nonetheless, never test before them. And they're really important. I'd say this is the most important test we do with someone who comes in with a breast cancer history or a high risk of breast cancer. So to run complete hormones, get an idea of the, these downstream estrogen metabolites. You want to have a good amount of the. Let's use this. You get. <laughs> You get to, you want you want to have a, a good amount of the two hydroxyesterones because they help to kill cancer, prevent the spread of cancer cells, and you can raise this by giving um, cruciferous vegetables and an extract from cruciferous vegetables called dim, which is diindole something or other, and 
you want to have a, we're looking at the ratio of the 2 to 16. You want to have a good high ratio of 2 hydroxyestrone to 16 hydroxyestrone. 16 hydroxyestrone and 4 hydroxyestrone promote cancer by causing DNA adducts, which are um, uh, 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 carcinic adducts are um, DNA changes that can form uh, a carcinogenic process. Fruits and veggies, we all know about these, but the average American will eat three to seven a day. Um, this, is, this is like priority number one in terms of cancer prevention. Um, we got it, it's, it's priority number one in just about everything, actually, I should say, not just cancer prevention, but any degenerative disease and anyone who wants to lose weight and anyone who's looking to reach optimal health. This is where it all really starts. We have to get, you know, foods are medicine. And uh, we have no idea what, you know, we can try to replicate this in supplements to some degree, but we're never going to be successful. There's way more um, action that nature puts into nutrients that we don't, that we don't really know about. And uh, so, you know, we can take supplements up the wazoo, and I certainly am a proponent of people supplementing, and I can put people on plenty of them, but, you know, you're missing the boat if you're not optimizing your diet. And this is really the first place people need to look. People are only getting three servings a day of vegetables and fruits, and they need to be getting nine. Um, if you've had the opportunity uh, to see Terry Wall's talk on Yahoo, it's really worthwhile. It's 20 minutes, uh, and it'll change your life. If you just go into Yahoo and put in Terry Wall, W-A-H-L. Um, she is a medical doctor who got, uh, has, has anybody seen this? Did anybody know her? Yeah. She just wrote a book called The Wall Protocol, too, which I have. I haven't read it yet, but you can get the book, too. But just watch the Yahoo video. It's 20 minutes. She's a medical doctor who got MS, and uh, very, you know, over the over the course of three to five years, her MS progressed to the point where she was in a wheelchair. She realized, and she's on staff at the University of Iowa, so she's a medical doctor. She's on clinical factory at the University of Iowa. She's an academic clinician as well. She realized there was nothing the medical establishment could do for her, so she basically went onto Google and started researching this herself, and. Um, came up with a plan for herself where she had nine servings of vegetables a day, which included three cups a day of cruciferous vegetables, three cups a day of uh, sulfur-rich vegetables, and three cups a day of colorful fruits and vegetables. She also included organ meat, and she also included seaweed. And that was the basis of what her diet was. And she also realized that she wasn't going to get this from supplements. And it was all about correcting mitochondrial damage. How do we correct mitochondrial damage? She said she was going to do it with diet. Well, um, she rides a bike to work now. Um, she's amazing. It's an amazing story. Um, it, it, watch, watch the video. 20 minutes. It's, it's really worthwhile. And if you've got my, my Dietary Handout, you'll know that my Dietary Handout looks very, very similar to what she recommends. Three cups a day of the leafy greens, three cups a day of sulfur-rich veggies, three cups a day of colorful fruits and veggies. Um, more phytoactive nutrients. Um, the Allen family, these are rich in, in chemicals called thiols, quercetin, sulfides, rosemary is rich in something called carnosol, which is also protective against uh, estrogen dependent breast cancer. Berries are rich in egallic acid. Citrus is rich in D limone. They're all well researched. They all have major anti cancer properties, and there's a bunch of chemicals we don't probably know about. So, the moral of the story, again and again, again, is just you know, have a wide variety of fruits and vegetables in your diet. Basic dietary approach, um, decreased consumption of pro-inflammatory foods, what are pro-inflammatory foods, those are allergens. It's worthwhile for everybody to try to figure out what foods they're sensitive to. Um, there's various means of doing that. Uh, I'm not crazy about any of the testing that's out there to do it. Um, I'm working with a book right now called The Plan, um, which is a, a means of figuring out which foods you're sensitive to by whether you gain weight or lose weight on, on foods you're eating. And I, um, have just lost 10 pounds in 13 days doing this. Um, I'm on day 13 of day 21. And so uh, I'm really impressed. And I have a bunch of patience to it. Um, uh, Lynn Jeanette something or other is the author. And uh, you know, if someone would have showed me the book, I would have put it. But all I know is like I had phenomenal results with it. Um, restrict sugar, obviously. Um, so a low glycemic diet, um, li limit your amounts of omega-6 fatty acids. We're going to talk about that in depth coming up here soon. And obviously, be really careful with pesticides and herbicides. It's really good. I, it's, it's a worthwhile thing to spend extra money to make sure that you have really clean food sources that don't have any uh, toxins on them. And maximize fruits, veggies, and spices. Spices 
pound for pound, spices are by far the highest in phytonutrients. They kick butt compared to fruits and vegetables. So the more we can get things like, and, and I have it on my food handout, you know, the spices, the more you can get basil, oregano, thyme, uh, cumin, turmeric, um, uh, coriander, cinnamon into your diet, the better. Look for ways to get those into your diet because nothing compares to spices in terms of how potent they are for phytonutrients and, and anti-cancer properties. Uh, optimal food choices, um, organic is obviously important, particularly when you're dealing with uh, animal products and fats and certain veggies. If you're on a limited diet, go to Environmental Working Group's website, ewg.org. Um, and you can look up what's called the Dirty Dozen, and they basically tell you the foods that have the highest pesticide levels, and you can avoid those. Certain foods like avocados and, um, and, and, and uh, tropical fruits have lower amounts of pesticides and herbicides, so if you're concerned if money's an issue, you can, you, know, you can figure out, you can strategize. But definitely with eggs, with foods that are high in fat, um, like cheeses, and with uh, dairy products, with meat products, it's really important to get clean food sources and not make conventional food sources if at all possible. How about the oils, vegetable fats, oils? Don't eat them. At all? Yeah, uh, as far as oils go, uh, I would minimize vegetable oils as much as you possibly can. Um, so the oils that I think people should be consuming would be olive oil, coconut oil, red palm oil, um, ghee. Those are the only ones I think people need. Sometimes I'll use, uh, 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 what kind of fat is olive oil? Can I say? So sometimes I'll get the high monounsaturated sesame oil from the co-op spectrum makes that. Most sesame oil is not. It's mostly high polyunsaturated fat. But if you can get the high polyunsaturated sesame or sunflower, those are okay. I'll use those on occasion. Yeah. Uh, I've never used hemp oil. I don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we're going to talk about inflammation now. Um, Inflammation basically is associated with every chronic disease there is, including cancer being in a lot of ways a chronic disease as well. Um, the evidence indicates that all cancer, from all cancer-related deaths, 25 to 30 percent are due to tobacco, 30 to 35 percent are linked to diet, 15 20 percent are due to infections, 15 to 30 percent are due to other factors. Radiation exposure, and by the way, radiation exposure takes about 30 years. So if you're exposed to radiation when you're seven, you'll most likely get cancer from that at age 37. So there's a long leeway for right there. Um, genetics, uh, stress, a sedentary lifestyle, environmental pollutants. It's been theorized that inflammation is a link between all the aging factors that cause cancer in the aging system. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So we have inflammation will um, lead to cancer. That's the main idea. The mechanism? Yeah. Yeah. Um, hopefully we're going to get to that here. So hang tight. Okay. Um, so we have a lot of studies linking inflammation with cancer and inflammation with cancer survivor, survival shift. Um, this one shows measurement of specific inflammatory response predicts cancer specific and non-cancer survival in patients with cancer. Um, this other one shows that epide epidemiological research demonstrates a 40 to 50 percent decrease in the risk of breast cancer of, amongst women who have, are chronic users of NSAIDs. I don't think you should go out and use NSAIDs necessarily, but it's really interesting that people who are chronically, who are, who are um, long-term taking anti-inflammatories, NSAIDs and aspirin, do have a lower rate of cancer. And inhibit COX-2 is one way, um, which is, which is uh, COX inhibition is one way. Can cancer basically, um, I don't think we know for sure how cancer and inflammation, uh, the mechanism exactly, but we know they like each other. Cancer cells like to use inflammatory cytokines, particularly COX-2, LOX-5 are the biggies. Um, we know that one of the reasons chemotherapy oftentimes doesn't work is because inflammatory cytokines get in there and cancer cells are able to use inflammatory cytokines to block themselves from chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so oftentimes when someone's going through chemotherapy, one of the main things we want to do is help to down-regulate inflammatory cytokines so the chemo can be more effective. So here you go, you know, this, this gives you some more information, this chart, botanical modulation of the arachidonic, arachidonic acid cascade. So this is talking about inflammatory cytokines. The biggies we talked about are COX-2. Celebrex is a pharmaceutical that blocks COX-2. And in the clinic, we actually prescribe Celebrex for patients as an anti-cancer um, agent. Particularly when we see elevated levels of inflammatory cytokines, we're oftentimes looking at a biomarker called uh, highly specific C-reactive protein. We're also looking at interleukin-8, interleukin-6, sed rate. 
when we see those coming up high, that scares me a lot when I see somebody with cancer in an elevated uh, C-reactive protein. And if we can't get them down with botanicals, we'll put them on cell reps. Um, but this chart's really cool because it's showing all where are the botanicals, where they, they actually have their mode of action. This is licorice and quercetin come into play here. Licorice and curcumin come into play here. Quercetin, garlic, curcumin, boswellia. They block LOX5, like oxygenase. Um, ginger, curcumin, quercetin, I don't know what that is. Uh, I don't know, you know, you guys know what those three are? Silk, no, no, no. Oh, black cumin seed. Uh -huh. um, um, they, those block Cox Hive, other inflammatory botanicals, uh, you know, these talk about some other scutellaria, quercetin, the other inflammatory pathways that work, they work on. Confirious lab. What's that? Confirious lab. Oh, you know what? The the I can't remember the um, second. That one? Yeah. Slow. Slow. Mm -hmm. Like the we have here the native. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Native the native blackberries. Cool. Um, you know, major anti-inflammatory foods. You can guess these. I wouldn't have to show you these. Um, but you know, uh, dark berries, apples, green tea, ginger, leafy greens. Not rocket science, but stuff we really need to be conscious of working into our diet on a regular basis. And dark chocolate on there is dark chocolate without the sugar. Yeah. Dark chocolate without the sugar. Although, uh, it's interesting, in the book that I'm working in now, she specifically says not to have um, chocolate higher than 65% cacao because she feels it's too acidic. So she actually wants you to just have a maximum of 65%, which has been like a vacation for me. Um, at least that 80% favorite stuff. Right. And uh, she says it's, it's less acidic. So where do you get? Chocolate that doesn't have the sugar in it. You can get it at the co-op. Yeah, you, well, all, all, unless you have baker's chocolate, all is going to have sugar. And the point is, the higher the percentage of cacao, the less sugar. So if you get milk chocolate, it's going to have a ton of sugar in it. If you get 80%, it's going to have very little in it. Uh, more anti-inflammatory foods. This is from uh, Dr. Agrawal. Dr. Agrawal is uh, the main researcher of curcumin. We're going to be talking about him later. These are foods that block NF-kappa B. NF-kappa B is on the top of the food chain of inflammation. It all kind of stems from there, so that's the main place we want to inhibit. Uh, we're going to shift to omega-3s because those are, have potent anti-inflammatory properties. Um, we know that omega-6 fatty acids like, like, that are in vegetable oils tend to have a pro-inflammatory uh, property, whereas omega-3 tend to have anti-inflammatory properties. And we're looking for a good balance of omega-3s to omega-6s. Um, we also know that omega-6 fatty acids pr uh, produce pro-inflammatory compounds which promote tumor growth, foster angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is the blood supply growing in cancer cells, how they spread, and they suppress immune function. And omega-3s omega promote cancer cell self-destruction, increase the rate of die-off, and slow tumor growth. Um, Omega-6s are mostly vegetable oils, except for monosaturated fats, which are good, like olive oil. There are nuts and seeds. You don't want to go crazy on nuts and seeds for that reason. They're good, but to a point. You can eat too much. Polyunsaturated uh, omega-3s are in fish. They're in sardines and salmon and tuna. Um, flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds, and walnuts. Um, this chart shows that uh, in prehistoric time or uh, Paleolithic time, you probably had a one-to-one -one ratio of omega-3s to omega-6, good fats to, to bad fats. I don't really consider omega-6 to be bad fats. It's just what the ratio is. Early 1900s, it was a four-to-one four to ratio, and today it's about a 40-to-one one ratio, according to some estimates, mm. based on the average American, what the average American needs. So we really want to try to bring that to a, someplace between a two-to-four-to-one ratio. Um, functions of omega-3s, the big things to get out of this slide that has a lot of info in it is that it's uh, the major anti-inflammatory properties and they can affect gene expression in a positive way. Epigenetics, we talked about that before. Omega-3s is one way that we can affect GNA expression. So I think it's something to do this yeah. graph, the last, the current bars is what you're looking for. Um, you're looking for four to one. You're looking for yeah. anywhere between two to four to one ratio. Yeah. So we don't have to quite go back to Paleolithic days, but okay. if they were on the right track. 
um, tissue oil breast cancer progression. Um, so we have data that shows the growth of breast cancer cells in culture and in mice in vivo is inhibited by omega-3 fatty acids. So it's actually a potent anti-cancer agent. Um, and omega-3 fatty acids activate an enzyme called blah, 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 which generates the release of ceramides, <laughs> a compound that ultimately causes cancer cell death, which is actually known as apoptosis. That was published in the International Journal of Cancer. Spino... Dr. Hirsch? Spino Oh, there you go. Good. What is it? Well, I don't know. Spate, well, got it. Yeah. Sounds like an enzyme that eats up myelin. <laughs> so um, we're, we're going to talk a lot about labs tonight from the perspective of um, this is how we monitor the terrain. We monitor the terrain by doing a lot of lab work and other ways, but mostly by lab work. And these are good things for you to, to, to take in to talk to your oncology about, to talk to your doctor about. Most conventional oncologists, most conventional docs don't run most of the labs that we, that we run. Um, CRP is C-reactive protein, which is, uh, gives us an idea of, of systemic inflammation in the body. It doesn't tell us where it is exactly, but kind of tells us that there's inflammation in the body. It gives us a good starting point. Fibrinogen tells us, it has to do with blood viscosity, but it's also what's known as an acute phase responder. So it'll go up when there's inflammation in the body. We can look at blood lipid levels. Um, we, we do a test now in the clinic. Uh, we use a lab called uh, HDL, which gives us blood lipid levels. We also, through Genova and Metametrics, we can look at essential fatty acid profiles that give us blood lipid levels. Omega-3 supplements. All right, you got, here's the caveat with omega-3 supplements uh, and why I'm cautious with them. So, um, they're great, and they're, an omega, they're, they're a polyunsaturated fats. Polyunsaturated fats are unstable fats. So they can oxidize really, really quickly. Um, you need to combine them with antioxidants in one form or another. I don't like to give people omega-3 fats by themselves and not tell them to take them with antioxidants because they can oxidize, they can cause free radical damage. Even omega-3 is good stuff. Um, and there's some data that we have that says it can be immune suppressive if we use it in really high doses. So it's not likely, but it's a concern. So I am cautious about using huge doses of omega-3s and I like them combined with uh, antioxidants. Um, Natura, which is Donnie Yance's company, which is a lot of their products, they make a, a, an awesome product, which I call the Cadillac here, it's called uh, Beyond Essential Fats, and he combines it with sea buckthorn oil, which is a very potent antioxidant, um, which protects it, I think. I think it's a great way to do it, to do that. Unfortunately, his pro that product costs about double of the other products on the market, so it's expensive. So I take it, but I really recommend it to patients because I'm, this is so expensive, but he combines it with sea buckthorn oil and pine seed oil. Pine seed oil gives you gamma-linolytic acid, which is another uh, really important anti-inflammatory essential fat. So you get all this nice loveliness in one formula, but it's really expensive. Um, Formax makes a product we like a lot called Finest Pure Fish Oil. We use that when we want to dose high, and there are some cases when we want to dose high. That gives you about two grams per teaspoon, which is a really high dose. Designs for Health, which is a company we use a lot, they, they have um, uh, something, all the products are combined to triglyceride. Most of the cheap uh, omega 3s that you'll get at Costco and the like are ethyl esters, and uh, the triglyceride one's more bioavailable, it's also more stable and more natural. So, um, you know, I used to say it's okay to get the cheap fish oils as long as they're tested for heavy metals and the like. If they're not triglyceride bound, you are at a disadvantage compared to something that's a true TG, and most of the big companies now, Pharmax does it, Designs does it, Natura does it use that. A lot of companies like Nordic Naturals, which I don't recommend, not because I think their product's bad, I just think their product's overpriced, um, but they'll use the term pharmaceutical grade all over their stuff. It means absolutely nothing. It's a red herring. Um, there is no pharmaceutical grade in this country for, for nutritional supplements, so people get turned off by that. Wow, this is pharmaceutical grade. It means absolutely nothing. There's no pharmaceutical grade nutritional supplements in the United States. So if you want to pay 20% more for their products, because it says pharmaceutical grade, it's a good product, you just don't need it. Um, Anti-inflammatory protocols, so the labs we're looking at is a CRP, highly sensitive. Don't let your doctor run just a regular CRP, you want the highly sensitive CRP. It's also called cardiac CRP, so a lot of docs get thrown off and say, oh, we only need to run that if we're looking at heart disease. It's baloney. It's, it's a better test, and you want that to be under one. Um, the, the reference range oftentimes will go up to three, and oftentimes we ignore the reference ranges. Our parameters are a lot tighter than what the reference ranges are. So normal on a reference range doesn't actually mean that much to us. We want that lab under, under one. Now, and now, you know, we're getting into an age now people can actually order their own labs too. There's direct labs, 
so people can actually do this themselves. You don't always have to go through the gatekeeper or your doctor. And unfortunately, a lot of doctors don't do proactive lab testing like we do, and the, the doctors at Heart of Wellness do. So these guys are from Heart of Wellness. Better. I work at Heart of Wellness two days a week. I do acupuncture. This is Fred Clemmer. He's a good friend and an awesome guy. And uh, Laura Jimenez, she's one of she's a naturopathic doctor there. And uh, I do my acupuncture there two days a week, and, and I work with these guys, and they're awesome. Um, and sorry I didn't introduce you earlier. I forgot. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I was nervous. Uh, so, uh, C-reactive protein, we do regularly on patients. If you have cancer or you don't. Sed rate is another one. Sometimes you will pick it up and CRP. You know, sometimes it's not a straight line. Sometimes people have inflammation, we want to pick it up, so we want to look at different markers. So we're looking at sed rate, we're looking at fibrinogen, we're looking at ferritin. Ferritin is a storage form of iron. The interesting thing about ferritin is it's also what's known as an acute phase responder, an acute phase protein, so it will elevate if there's inflammation in the body, irregardless, irregardless is the word, regardless of iron status. So we'll often have to check that as, a, as an inflammatory marker. Other markers that we like to look at are uh, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, tumor necrosis factor alpha. We pick all these up on a great test that Genova Diagnostics has called a pre-D, a pre-diabetes panel. And there's such a strong link between the same inflammatory cytokines in diabetes that there are with cancer. And those tend to be really expensive tests to run, but if we do it through the pre-D pre test, it only costs like 50 or 60 bucks, and you get the whole panel. It's really great. Treatment for this, fish oil. You want to get a total omega-3 of anywhere between 1 and 3 grams, or 1,000 and 3,000 milligrams a day. Balanced blood sugar, it's huge. Getting your blood sugar under control, um, that's another one. Inflammation shows up with most chronic diseases, and dysglycemia, which we're going to talk about, which is um, blood sugar imbalances sh show up also with most chronic debilitating illnesses. And we're going to talk a lot about blood sugar and cancer coming up here. Intake of high ORAC fruits and vegetables and spices. ORAC is a marker we use for antioxidant level. You'll see it listed because they have ORAC levels for various fruits and vegetables you have. So like pomegranates have a really high ORAC. The best ORAC in liquids is coffee. Surprising. Um, limit hydrogenated fats. Don't limit them. Get, them. get them the hell out of your diet. And trans fats um, and veggie oils in general. Optimize vitamin D levels, really easy to test your vitamin D levels, and we'll talk about that coming up here. Antioxidant supplements, antioxidants um, have anti-inflammatory properties. So when we talk about inflammation and oxidation, we're talking about one and the same thing pretty much. And make sure you get foods that you're sensitive to out of your diet. The biggies are gluten, dairy, and soy, and corn. Um, the book that I'm working with now, she has a very different take on that. She feels certain foods that we think are really, really healthy, she sees show up being sensitive to her patients. So she says that 80% uh, of her patient population is sensitive to salmon. I think it's important to note too that, you know, no two protocols are the same. You know, when David's doing this, <clears throat> he's individualizing everything. So I think that's really important to have a provider who's doing that because then you can um, get appropriate treatments for you. And that's why, you know, we, 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 we want a customized treatment. You know, one of the things that bothers me about conventional care is what's known as the standard of care is based on what the average patient will respond to. You know, you know, you have this type of cancer, so the average patient, this is what we use, this is the standard of care. That's great. I don't want to be the average patient. You know, I want to be me. I want, tell me more about the specifics of my cancer that we can do to, 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 to customize treatment. And that's what bothers me about conventional care and some of the laboratory testing that we help to do helps to do that. And then selling the oncologist is sometimes an uphill battle, but that's, that's you know, what, what our passion is in, our, in the clinic. But with the stuff we're doing, it's all customized. So we're doing a lot of lab work. We're doing these labs that give us insight into where you need um, remedial care. And we're going to talk more about the lab work at the end of the case. Um, Chronic stress and cancer, um, you know, there's a link between stress and all disease. We all know this. Um, in the data we have, we don't have data that shows that stress brings on cancer. We have data that shows that if you have cancer, stress can make it worse. And that's in the literature right now. Um, what we think about when we think about stress and modulating stress, uh, other than the, the most important, which is figuring out ways, centering techniques that we can use to help bring ourselves back to a, to a place of center and peacefulness, um, is using um, botanicals like what are called adaptogen herbs. Yeah, you... What about the, the stress creating, I can't remember the names of the ends of the, of the chromosomes. Telomores? Yeah, yeah. That, that shorten it? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, we have a lot of data about cancer and, and telomeres and how they affect disease and degeneration and aging, yeah. And, you know, one of the ways that we help to shift that, we have data also that shows a certain number of herbs to shift that, such as adaptive nerves. Um, what are adaptive nerves? You might ask. They, um, the nerves that help the body adapt to stress. They tend to grow, yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't know that they uh, would fall into the category of adaptogens, but um, I know that certain essential oils like lavender have a, a kind of. And lavender, I don't think is considered an adaptogen. It's more of a nerve Do you, you know it's more of a you know what category it would be? Yeah. I think it's, it's all. I think it is a nerve It's yeah. not an adaptogen. Right. It's not. It's a little different. There are different properties, and they can be used together. So I actually like the idea of combining things like. Uh, Donnie makes a formula called Tranquility, which has things like kava in it, and L-theanine, and melissa balm, and um, saffron in it. And then he'll oftentimes use those and, give, and use the adaptogen formulas as well. So adaptogens help the body adapt to stress. They help the body adapt to physical, mental, emotional stress. Um, they tend to grow in harsh climates because they uh, have to survive. They secrete chemicals that help them survive in harsh climates. Animals in those climates are known to dig them up and eat them to help them survive. If we grow, if we cultivate them outside of those climates, they will tend to produce different chemicals than they do. When we consume them, they help us survive in harsh climates, which is our day-to-day -day world, and it gets a lot harder if we have cancer. Um, Adaptogens are something I think everyone should take all the time. Of my list of things where I say these, everybody should be on. Everybody should be on adaptogens, in my opinion. Um, we are exposed. We live in a, in a toxic, stressful world, and taking adaptogen botanicals, which are like herbal multivitamins, in my opinion, are a necessity. Um, these are some studies on the individual adaptogens. It's a Leuthrococcus or uh, Siberian ginseng. Um, it helps to increase the ability to withstand adverse physical conditions as well as enhance job productivity, mental performance, concentration, and alertness. This is rhodiola. Um, this enhances the body's natural resistance and adaptation to stressful influences while promoting mental endurance and, and metabolic efficiency. Chisandra is a famous Chinese herb that Fred and I know very well. Um, ashwagandha, it's a really famous Ayurvedic herb, which I like a lot, known as Indian ginseng, um, ability to promote mental and physical vitality and stamina. When somebody is about to go into surgery, when somebody is about to is undergoing chemotherapy, I want them on a lot of adaptogens because we are trying to, what's our job when somebody's under the stress of surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy? Our job is to keep the healthy as healthy as possible. And adaptogens are number one on my list for doing that. They can come in either. You know, it's working with those herbs that tend to be adaptions. Those are the, the biggies that I just showed. Um, Donnie Ants, this is his kind of, uh, this is his baby. He just wrote a book called Adaptogens and Medical Herbalism. He's probably the foremost, one of the foremost experts in the world on adaptogens. So he's designed products through Natura. One of them's called Vital Adapt, one of them's called Power Adapt, and one of them's called Botanabol that I use a lot in my practice and I like a lot. Uh, blood sugar, blood sugar and stress kind of go hand in hand. We know that um, that 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 uh, cortisol, which is affected by, um, which is a, 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 a hormone that the adrenals secrete, um, is is very much affected by blood sugar regulation. We know that uh, insulin and cortisol kind of follow each other. So. If we have elevated cortisol levels, we'll see elevated insulin levels, and the opposite as well. If we have low cortisol levels, we'll send the hypoglycemia or low insulin levels with blood sugar. Um, we live in a culture where we have abundant food, and particularly abundant carbohydrates. We have a tendency to eat too much of that, and then that causes our blood sugar to rise. The body produces insulin to take that blood sugar stored in the cells, and over time, the body gets tired of doing that. Uh, process and it gets what's called insulin resistant. 
So our body stops producing as much or has to produce more insulin to get that sugar out of there and we become less effective at it. Um, what that means is that our blood sugar levels rise. Blood sugar is incredibly corrosive to the arterial system and that's why diabetics get diabetic neuropathy and they get um, uh, uh, issues with their eyes and um, uh, the arthritis and things like that the like because of the, how caustic and problematic blood glucose is and it doesn't get stored properly. Um, and we end up on this treadmill towards diabetes uh, in, in the way there where it's something called metabolic syndrome, which I, most of my patients have a degree of metabolic syndrome, including myself. Um, uh, and it comes from eating a lot of uh, uh, abundant and easy carbohydrates. Um, insulin tends to increase uh, an enzyme in the body called aromatase. And aromatase um, can promote tumor growth. Insulin itself can promote tumor growth, and insulin can produce something called insulin-like growth factor, which is a major signaling, signaling pathway for, for cancer cells. Um, sugar, cancer cells love sugar. We know that from looking at PET scans. Well, how does a PET scan work? Well, they put glucose in, and the cancer cells go to the glucose. It's pretty well known. Um, and sugar is an immune suppressant. We know that too. Um, the link between cancer and sugar, uh, it's really clear. I mean, it's a very, very clear link. This, look, this study looked at um, 65,000 people over 13 years, and it showed those with high blood sugars had a higher incidence of cancer with pancreas, breast, skin, uterus, and urinary tract. Women in the top quarter of blood sugar readings have 26% higher chance of developing cancer than those in the bottom quarter. Um, this showed elevated fasting serum glucose levels were associated with a 27% increased risk in cancer mortality and then 31% risk in women. That was uh, published in the Journal of American Medicine. David? Yeah. Do they have any evidence that people with cancer tend to be crave sugar more? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's, a, it's a good question. I don't know. But you know, we do we have a lot of strategies that we use, um, like fasting around chemotherapy. Because cancer cells, uh, the, the healthy cells can survive without glucose, but cancer cells have a very difficult time. So one, uh, and we have, you know, nice data to support this. Although again, it's not it's not used by conventional oncologists yet. But if we um, fast, or very very lightly around chemotherapy, will we'll, it gives the cancer it's a double whammy because the cancer cells are getting hit by the chemotherapy and they're getting starved of the nutrient supply. Um, this study shows obesity correlates with poor survival outcomes. So this is a link between you know, obesity and high insulin levels and high sugar. And like I talked about, this also talks about um, uh, obesity is likely to be factors such as insulin resistance and the upregulation of the insulin, insulin -like growth factor system, along with concurrent increases in other hormonal tumor promoters such as estrogen. So IGF, that shows up a lot in cancer circles these days as a major upregulator of various cancer pathways, insulin-like growth factor. Um, this talks about uh, what we just talked about, that, that um, chronic hyperinsulinemia, elevated insulin levels, can lead to a high level of signal activation through the IGF-1 system, both enhancing cell proliferation, reducing apoptosis, cancer cell death. May impair the response to a variety of chemotherapy agents, as well as reduce responsiveness to um, various cancer treatments. These are some specific foods you want to focus on to help lower blood sugar. It's kind of missing the point. You really want to just be on a low glycemic diet rather than sort of focusing on foods that you think are going to lower blood sugar. And what that means is really minimizing starch and sweets. Uh, min totally, you know, very, very limited amounts of white foods, white grains in particular. Um, patients who really want to do this full tilt will come off starches completely or, you know, minimize starches a lot in their diet because that's really the biggest change in blood sugar effect. The labs we're looking at, um, and I look at these for everybody who walks through the door, um, not just folks with cancer, we want a fasting glucose, ideal 70 to 90. I love it when patients are willing, and I do this myself, to check your blood sugar at home. It's the only way you're really going to know, uh, you have no idea, because you know, if you're running high blood sugars, you don't know until you take a test. And uh, if you're wondering if the food you just ate caused your blood sugar to elevate, well, test your blood an hour later, test your blood two hours later, test your blood the next morning. It's the only way we really know. I don't think that that's uh, something just diabetics and pre-diabetics should do. I think anybody who's really interested in optimizing their health should go out, pay $18 or whatever it is for a glucometer. 
then you go to Amazon to buy the test strips because that's where it gets expensive, and don't find them in the drugstore. Test your blood sugar. You know, you know, people are always saying, I, this food's fine for me. I can eat this. I can eat brown rice. Well, prove it to me. Show it to me. Eat it. Two hours later, test your blood sugar. See what happens. Um, Postprandial blood sugar, if you want it around 110 or less. Triglycerides, which is a very important uh, um, fat to monitor, much more important than cholesterol. I think cholesterol, I, I, I'm close to saying that cholesterol is a waste of time to monitor. I, 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 I won't. This is Tim Shannon. He's a, he's a uh, physician here in town, also at Heart and Wellness. We have half the Heart and Wellness community here. <laughs> and he, he works with a lot of cancer patients as well. Um, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I think you know cholesterol gets all the attention. I, I'm close to saying cholesterol is a useless test to monitor. It really tells us very, very little. You have to look a lot deeper than cholesterol. We do sophisticated cholesterol uh, lipid analysis here in the clinic where we actually are able to see if there's uh, an issue with lipids. And cholesterol is just on top of the surface. Triglycerides, on the other hand, tells us a lot. And you want triglycerides to be under 100. Triglycerides sets the stage for uh, 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 lipid imbalances. So it's a very important marker. Um, height to weight ratio, waist ratio, a really important one to look at when you're thinking about dyslysemia metabolic syndrome. You want it to be less than 2 to 1. Well, greater than 2 to 1, excuse me. Um, salivary cortisol. Um, we can monitor cortisol levels. Cortisol, again, is a stress handling hormone that is created by the adrenals. And we can monitor that with a salivary test. It's also a urine test that monitors it. It's not great to monitor in blood because you just get a snapshot of it. We like to look at it four times in one day. Um, if cortisol is elevated, you're going to have a tendency to be uh, hyperinsulinemic and on a stage to metabolic syndrome and prediabetes. If it's too low, you're, you're likely to be hypoglycemic. Hemoglobin A1C is a great test to monitor for cancer patients and just about anybody. This is a three-month average of blood sugar, um, and this gives you this averages it out for you. So rather than looking at it on a day-to-day -day basis, if you just get a blood test, you just get glucose. That's what it was that day. This looks at it over a three-month average. Really important one to test. Um, we do it all the time in the clinic. Um, uh, conventional docs tend to only test it if someone's pre-diabetic or if they're diabetic, and I think that's crazy. It's like why wait till you get to that point? Let's do this before there's a problem. Um, and you want to ideally have that under 5.4. And we'll see that elevated in a lot of patients. I think one of the uh, really fun things about that um, HDL test is that now we're <clears throat> people can, can show up as, um, as negative for diabetes, but now we're, we've got really good markers for pre-diabetes. So even if your, your doctor is digging, um, they still may not find the pre-diabetes, and we can actually test to see you know, if your pancreas is uh, is getting worn out by the amount of insulin it's producing, it's really exciting. So, so yeah, I, I want to talk about that. We just started using this lab called the HDL in our clinic, um, and it's amazing. It's uh, it it it, uh, it tests. Uh, it, we get we get about eight pages of data from it, and uh, it's a it's an advanced uh, cholesterol testing. We specialize in diabetes and cholesterol, so it gives you a plethora of information about lipids. We don't even we really don't even look at the cholesterol number. Um, we, we, and some people come, some people have 180 cholesterol and they have, they're a disaster with their lipids. Right. It really tells us almost nothing. Um, and then it gives us an enormous amount of information about blood sugar regulation. And the awesome thing about that test is that if you have insurance, they will bill your insurance and you will pay nothing, regardless of whether insurance pays it or not, or if it eats your deductible. So that's their deal. And they put that in their literature. They hand you something when they get the test back saying to you, you will not pay anything. If you get anything from us that looks like a bill, throw it out. It's not. It's a fantastic test. We just started using it in the past few months, and I'm loving it. It's, it's giving us great, great data. And it's free for anyone. Medicare is free. Anyone who has any type of insurance or Medicare, it's zero. You said HDL? HDL, yeah, health diagnostic labs. And we're trying to get it at heart and wellness now, too. Right? Yes. Yes. Uh, vitamin D. Uh, we all know about vitamin D, so we're going to spend a lot of time talking about it. Most of us do. It's really a hormone rather than a vitamin. Um, uh, we can't get any vitamin D in our um, locale at latitudes north of, uh, of Massachusetts and south of uh, Georgia, I think. Um, you don't get any vitamin D in the wintertime. So uh, we pretty much get none here. So we have to supplement. Um, pretty much everybody we test comes back low. Um, and it's really, really important in uh, uh, cell differentiation and gene expression. 
So that's why I have that as a, it's, you know, we, we look at it as an anti-cancer agent. It affects over a thousand genes throughout the body. There's vitamin D receptors all throughout the body. Um, important for calcium balance, uh, important for cell differentiation. So cancer is a disease of poorly differentiated cells, so we're looking to things that will help cell differentiation. Um, and it helps to, uh, so it has immune modulating properties also. It also enhances insulin sensitivity. So it's one of the big things we think about, we have vitamin D receptors are expressed by insulin secreting cells in the parenchyma. So when we see metabolic syndrome, vitamin D is one of the main things we'll put patients on. It also helps with blood pressure regulation. Vitamin D breast cancer risk, a lot of data here. This is a Long Island breast cancer study. Over a thousand women they looked at, women with blood levels of greater than 40 nanograms per milliliter or, or greater had a 40% less chance of getting breast cancer compared to those who had less than 20 nanograms per milliliter. Um, a uh, 16% less risk if levels were 20 to 29. That should be minus 16. Oh, no, 16% less, le yeah, yeah, okay. So if you're 20 to 29, 16% less risk, and even uh, uh, more soft if you were less than 20 to 29. Vitamin D deficiency is also linked with obesity, this talks about as well. This is another the Women's Health Initiative study, the 20% risk in reduction of breast cancer for women taking greater than the RDA dose of 400 IUs a day. The, the RDA dose of vitamin D is useless. Um, you know, in the old days, the theory was that fat-soluble vitamins can be toxic. We don't get rid of them. And um, I like to quote John Canal, who uh, runs vitamin D counseling, who's kind of written the most on vitamin D probably in the country, who says that it is possible to get toxic levels of vitamin D, but it's probably a, you have a greater chance of, of drowning in the desert. Um, so it's, uh, it's not really probable. Uh, you'd be written up in textbooks pretty much if you got vitamin D toxic. Uh, looking at the best available data, it seems that breast cancer odd ratios begin to drop significantly as serum vitamin D levels get to over 50 nanograms from the These are more studies. This was a Toronto study showed vitamin D deficiency had a two times increased risk of cancer recurrence. Back to the Long Island study, there were discrepancies between the outcomes if you were diagnosed in the summer versus the winter. They theorized that, that had to do with higher vitamin D levels in the summer um, and having better outcomes with breast cancer. Uh, better, and we also know that survival data is better for breast cancer in the southwest versus the northeast. Um, labs that everybody should be running, whether you have your doctor do this or do this yourself. 25 OHD is the most important one to run. That's the storage form of vitamin D. A lot of docs make a mistake and run 125, which is the active form of D. And you don't ever want to run 125 by itself. You got to run 25 OHD. Level should be 50 to 85. I, yeah, I, 40 to 85 is probably OK. Um, and sometimes it is a good idea to run 125 with it. You will see discrepancies in the two. With certain types of cancers, they can activate its own vitamin D, so you have to be careful. Oat cell carcinomas and, and some of the blood cancers, some of the lymphomas can actually activate vitamin D. So you've got to be careful if you have those cancers with vitamin D, and you have to test both, the 125 and the 25 OHD in those cases. The dosage is going to be anywhere from, we, we never give under 10 to 2,000 I use a day, I'd say. Up to 10,000. Dr. Hirsch uses up to 20,000 I use a day, but he's a bit of an average with that. I am. Yeah. Um, uh, on average, folks are going to need about 5,000 I use a day. If you're taking greater than 2,000 I use a day, you really need to test your levels periodically. Like I say, it's highly unlikely you have a problem, but you don't want to go on doing that for years and years without any testing. And there's really good data that says that vitamin D works best in combination with other fat soluble vitamins, especially vitamin K2. I, I don't use vitamin D without vitamin K2 at this point. Um, there's some data that says that vitamin D can um, can uh, uh, get into the um, can get into the arteries and get into the kidneys and cause kidney calcifications or arterial calcifications. So you want to give it with vitamin K2, so it's going to get into the bones where it's going to produce calcium in the bones rather than other places we don't want it to. Um, we'll oftentimes use a loading dose. If somebody's low, we'll use 20,000 IUs and we'll like sometimes 50,000 IUs. Um, but you really got to work with someone who knows what they're doing when they're doing that. One of my favorite ones is one called Vitamin D3 Complete, which is by Allergy Research Group. It's a lower dose, only 2,000 IUs a D, but I love that it gives you um, a high dose of vitamin K2, and it gives you a little bit of vitamin A, and it gives you uh, tocotrienols, which is a type of vitamin E, so it mixes all the fat soluble vitamins in one. Um, antioxidants. So 
So uh, there's, a, there's a whole theory on free radicals, and free radicals um, are electrons that are transferred to unstable molecules. Antioxidants come in and they scavenge free radicals by, uh, by uh, donating electrons to make those molecules stable. Um, we know that, that, that free radicals can cause DNA mutations or degrade or, de or, or, or uh, damage cells. They also can cause chain reactions that may damage cells. Um, as I mentioned, antioxidants scavenge free radicals by donating electrons to stabilizing them, by stabilizing them or donating them cells to protect healthy cells. Um, we can get free radicals. Free radicals are produced naturally in the body to some degree. They're produced endogenously and they're normal. They're also necessary sometimes for uh, as anti-cancer agents. So you don't want to completely uh, uh, get rid of free radicals, but you want a good balance of uh, free radicals that don't get out of control. So um, you want to have a good amount of antioxidants, primarily from foods, but you can get them from supplements as well, as well to scavenge free radicals. Environmental toxins are a big source of um, free radicals, particularly tobacco smoke, radiation, um, uh, phthalates, and things like that. Yeah, Gina? Is it possible to get too many antioxidants? Yes. Okay. It is. It is possible. Um, uh, there's a particular water purifier out that creates the antioxidants in the water, and that's my my main concern with that. Yeah, it is. You're not going to go wrong with foods. I think it's a good idea to have some supplemental antioxidants as well. We'll talk about those. Chronic uh, excessive oxidative stress promotes gene instability um, and can promote cancer. Uh, epigenetic benefits. Thank you. Um, this talks about the epigenetic benefits from a type of phenols in foods called flavonoids. Um, they're high in, in uh, teas, green and white teas, cruciferous vegetables, dark berries, citrus fruits, onions, and soy. And they're particularly good antioxidants. Um, this was a 2002 study that showed that green tea drinkers in China had a 50% reduction in gastric or esophageal cancer. The labs that we want to think about for assessing uh, antioxidant levels are ultra and C-reactive protein because inflammation and oxidation go together, so you can look at inflammation markers to get a sense. Um, autoimmune markers is a real link between autoimmune disease and oxidative stress, so looking at uh, various markers of autoimmunity are helpful. There's a urinary uh, MD, what are called MDA test, which look at a specific uh, free radical called lipid peroxide. And then uh, Genova, who we use a lot, and we talk about a lot, they have a great test called the NutriVal, and it gives us, and we run that test a lot, it gives us serum glutathione, it gives us coenzyme Q10, it gives us a marker for oxidized DNA, gives us lipid peroxide, and it also gives us markers for vitamin A, C, E, Z, selenium, and mitochondrial function, which is very involved in what's called redox balancing, which is that balance between having enough antioxidants and not too much. Antioxidant supplements, I really like the ones on Q10. Uh, I like it in the form of ubiquinol rather than ubiquinone, 100 milligrams once or twice daily. I like alpha lipoic acid, which helps to recycle other antioxidants like vitamin C and vitamin E. It's also water and fat soluble. I like N-acetylcysteine, which helps to upregulate glutathione, as does alpha lipoic acid. I like a product called Nature, called CD Rescue. It's my favorite formula for antioxidant balance, which combines both forms of CoQ10. It combines alpha lipoic acid, ginkgo, hawthorn, resveratrol, quercetin, really nice formula. Botanical treasures by Natura gives us a lot of multitasking herbs, but high doses of curcumin, green tea, resveratrol. I love this new product called the Organic Berry Powder by the Synergy Company. You can buy it on Amazon. We also carry it at the clinic at Heart and Wellness. Um, and basically it's all about 20 organic fruits and berries that have a high ORAC level. It's a really nice compromise between taking synthetic vitamins and foods. It also tastes really good, great in smoothies. We talked about broccoli seed extract, which I think is one of the best things to increase glutathione levels. We want to try to get 5,000, 5, 8,000 uh, units per day of ORAC from fruits and veggies. Um, this is a really interesting study that I found that showed, um, uh, was a, it just came out in 2013, that showed a link between high levels of 4-hydroxyestrone, um, we talked about that earlier, a really carcinogenic estrogen level, 
And uh, it showed in this study, they showed that the dietary supplements resveratrol and acetylcysteine, which are antioxidants, can act as preventing cancer agents by keeping estrogen metabolism balanced. These two compounds can reduce the formation of catechol estrogen quinones, which are incredibly oxidative and cancer promoting, and or the reaction with DNA. They also form DNA atoms. Therefore, as resveratrol and N-acetylcysteine provide a widely applicable, inexpensive approach to preventing many of the prevalent types of human cancer. This was just published a year ago. I love this. I have a theory working with breast cancer patients, or hormonal dependent breast cancer patients, that they oftentimes will have a, uh, what's called a SNP, or a genetic polymorphism in, 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 uh, in an enzyme called COMT. And COMT is involved in excreting or getting estrogen metabolites out of the body. And if they don't have enough of it, if they have a COMT SNP, which we can measure by doing a 23andMe test, and I like doing that, I'll take the 23andMe test, and then I'll take the complete hormones and put them together, and it's beautiful. I'll get to see how, what's their COMT status, and then I'll also get to see their 4-hydroxyestrone status. If this is elevated and someone who has a high risk of breast cancer, it gets my attention, big time. And so, you know, now I'm thinking, these are my two main go-tos for elevated 4-hydroxyestrone, N-acetylcysteine and, and resveratrol, in combination with a lot of other antioxidants and things that, uh, like broccoli seed extract. But now we have some hard data that actually shows this to be the case. So I have a theory that hasn't been shown yet, that women who are prone to hormone-dependent cancers have a genetic predisposition to not being able to excrete estrogen properly because they've got uh, what's called a, a genetic defect in the COMT enzyme. They're producing high levels of these, these, these uh, bad estrogen metabolites. It doesn't quite make sense to me that estrogen itself is bad. It shouldn't be, right? But there's something else going on here, and it's deeper. We haven't gotten to it yet. The conventional model hasn't figured it out. I have a theory. I don't know if I'm right, but this is what my theory is. So I'm very, you know, my patients with high-risk breast cancer, breast cancer cancer, we run a complete hormones test, and I like to do that every six months or yearly. Fantastic information we get from it, and we have things that can help to treat it. I'm going to talk about a couple herbs. Uh, curcumin is kind of the biggie. Uh, Dr. Agarwal at uh, MD Anderson has done the most research on curcumin. He, um, he, uh, there's over a thousand patients right now at MD Anderson, which is a huge cancer hospital in, in Houston, taking curcumin. There's eight human clinical trials that I know of on curcumin. Um, this is a major, what we call multitasking herb. It has antioxidant properties, it has anti inflammatory properties, it has uh, neuroprotective properties, it enhances detoxification pathways, hepatoprotective properties, cardioprotective properties, decreases LDL oxidation. Now, if you want to talk about lipids and cholesterol, this is an important marker, whether we're oxidizing our LDL. I don't really care what your cholesterol level is. You can have a cholesterol of 180, but if you have oxidized LDL, you're going to have heart disease. This is a great slide. This is Agarwal put this together. And what is this? This is all the cancer pathways that curcumin blocks. So these are all various transcriptional factors, inflammatory cytokines, various enzymes of cancer, signaling pathways that cancer uses kinases, growth factors, a bunch of cancer receptors. Curcumin has been shown to block all of these. Um, this slide also talks more in depth about the various pathways with this curcumin inhibits. And after kappa beta, we talked about that. That's the most important inflammatory pathway that we can work on. If we get that block, we block all the downstream inflammatory cytokines. COX-2, LOX-5, NOS, STAT-3. Really big, you know, when you, if you get into uh, academic articles on cancer, these pathways are talked about a lot right now. They're major signaling pathways of uh, promoting cancer growth. VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, you're going to get a mouthful about that in about 10 minutes. Um, HER2, you know about that, uh, uh, various types of breast cancer. TGFR, TGF beta 1, Dr. Shannon tested for that one. And tell me about testing for that one. Um, green tea, another major multitasking herb. You know, these are ones I give to my cancer patients and folks who are concerned about cancer risk all the time. They're seeing resveratrol, green tea, quercetin, and curcumin showing up in their herb formulas all the time. Um, we run out of them a lot at Heart Wellness. Um, you know, uh, green tea, uh, the big chemical we've been looking at in green tea is something called EGCG. There's uh, been a lot of trials on EGCG. Again, it shows it blocks multiple cancer pathways. Um, it's a major antioxidant. It helps to prevent repair carcinogenic DNA damage. We have a lot of epidemiological data out of China and Japan about people who have higher green tea intakes, have lower incidence of cancer. 
Um, we also know they can enhance P53. 50, P53 is known as the guardian of the genome. It's a really, really important cancer um, tumor, uh, um, tumor suppressor gene. So we want to really use nutraceuticals that help to increase things like P53 and also something called P10. It's a really another important tumor suppressor gene that will be mutated when we run these CARES reports on patients. We see a lot of P53 mutations, a lot of P10 mutations. We know, we have good data that there's certain nutraceuticals that can actually enhance and turn on these tumor suppressor genes. This is another green tea study showing that it inhibits uh, breast cancer. This is, most of these studies are out of Japan. They show here five cups a day, decreased recurrence rate, and increased survival. This one uh, talks about one capsule of green tea basically equals three cups. So you know you either drink a lot of it, or if you want to take it supplementally, you just need one cup capsule a day to give you the equivalent of three, three, um, three cups. So if you have two capsules a day, you get six cups. Botanical Treasures, which is an Natura product that I like a lot, one capsule gives you the equivalent of one cup a day, but we usually prescribe that at about six a day. That also gives you a huge dose of curcumin, resveratrol, and quercetin too. Here's resveratrol, another major multitasking herb that we use a lot. We saw it earlier in that 4-hydroxyesterone study that helps to inhibit that. Um, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, cardioprotective, really important for cardiovascular disease. Weight management, it helps to decrease something called aromatase. If you know breast cancer patients who postmenopausal, the main thing they're put on for hormone dependent cancer is aromatase inhibitors. Resveratrol naturally inhibits aromatase. Can you inhibit aromatase just by using resveratrol and not using conventional medicines? No, you can't. I wouldn't tell my patients to do that. Maybe you can, but I don't recommend it because we don't have data to say that it does. But it's a nice buffer to put in there in addition. Or some patients can't take it. We see patients a lot who can't take aromatase inhibitors. So you know, we don't tell them, we don't give them a false sense of security. Oh, you don't need to take your aromatase inhibitors, just take resveratrol. But we can say there's some data that supports that it will diminish your risk. Um, here's another great slide showing all the, the pathways that resveratrol works on, um, all the transcription factors, inflammatory pathways, the protein kinases, antioxidant enzymes, fantastic group. Okay. Uh, copper chelation. I want to spend uh, I want to spend a nice amount of time talking about this. This is something I'm very very passionate about. Um, this is, as far as I know, we're the only clinic in the state of Washington doing copper chelation right now, um, and it's something that there's a lot of data going on. I'm really really excited about. Why do we talk about this? Well, we know that um, high levels of copper play a role in cancer promotion. They play a role particularly in something called angiogenesis and uh, in something called VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. Angiogenesis, we talked about before, is how cancer cells build their vascular architecture, how they spread. Most of the VEGF pathways, as well as some of the inflammatory pathways, are copper dependent. Cancer cells need copper in order to grow. Um, these are two Quotes. This one was from the Michigan Oncology Journal, spring of 1998, when they first came up, they learned about this, a doctor named George Brewer. Most studies and model systems have shown that the key promoters of angiogenesis, how cancer cells build their blood supply, require binding digging, binding to copper in order to function properly. I, I picked that up earlier, I thought I fixed it. This need for copper is fairly widespread amongst pro-angiogenic molecules and observed to be present in many different types of tumors. This was by Stephen Brem, who actually just sent an email to me because I have questions for him, and he answered me back. He, at the time, he's at the University of Pennsylvania now, but at the time he was at the Moffitt Cancer Center, which was a very famous cancer center in Tampa Bay. And he did research, the early research on this in the late 90s, showing copper status is critical to the function of angiogenic growth factors. Copper binding molecules are non-angiogenic when free of copper, but they become angiogenic when bound to copper. Co cancer cells need copper in order to grow. This is a fact. This isn't conjecture at this point. This was the initial study by Dr. Brewer um, uh, in 2000 at the University of Michigan. They showed that in a small number of patients, when they decopper them, uh, uh, they, they, let's see, what did they do? They successfully stop the growth and spread of cancer by depriving tumors of the copper supply they need to form new blood vessels. So they had some data that showed that if you do this, actually work. If you deprive cancer cells of copper, they can't grow. Um, 
Uh, Dr. Brewer did uh, the majority of these trials um, and then did more trials. And what we found in the future trials was that they were mixed. We had some good results and we had some bad results. I actually recently spoke, I, Dr. Brewer's retired now, and we had a case of a patient who had a confusing picture, and I actually tracked him down and talked to him, he was great, and then I, I hooked him up with Dr. McKee, who's my mentor, who's done the most work, he's kind of picked the ball up, Dr. McKee, from where Brewer left off in the early 2000s, and we're talking about what McKee has done, and now McKee and Brewer are publishing data together, and I helped bring that in our so we're going to give that. Um, how do we find so we use what we used to get rid of? We use something called tetrathiamolybdate. Tetrathiamolybdate is a compounded uh, compound that is uh, molybdenum bound to sulfur. How did we come about it? We found out in the 40s that sheep that ate a very high diet of molybdenum and sulfur became copper deficient. Um, and now it's used for something called Wilson's disease. Wilson's disease is a, a disease where there's too high copper levels, and what they use is TM to get rid of it. Um, TM decomposes very, very quickly, so it has to be made properly. Can I ask a question? Yes. How do you get excess copper? I mean, how, where does it come from? Uh, food, primarily. We're getting most of our copper from foods. We're also getting it from our plumbing supply, so we have copper water and plumbing supply. And is it actually excess copper, or is it just you're removing the mechanism by which angiogenesis happens and that people's copper levels are essentially normal? Um, so we, we find that in patients who have cancer, they have elevated levels oh, of okay. copper, and that's one of our markers, that's one of our bioterrain labs, and we monitor to see, to get a sense of angiogenesis, where copper levels elevated. If they're not, we're usually, it's usually not but, uh, a big factor in angiogenesis. Okay. Is that your question? Yeah. Okay. TM, how does TM work? Uh, copper is essential for the angiogenesis process. I've said this about six times now. Brewer and his crew, um, you know, they theorize that, an, that, that there's an anti-angiogenic window, a range where we can bring the copper down to where tumor growth can be prevented, but the patient will have enough copper to survive for physiological functions. Um, so Brewer's studies didn't pan out that great. He had some studies that uh, were good and some studies that weren't. The whole thing kind of got dropped. Everybody said, this is a great idea. We know cancer cells need copper. You just did the trials. It didn't work. Been there, done that, goodbye. And a lot of people just dropped this. Dr. McKee, who's one of my mentors, who studies with Donnie Ants, who's an, who's an oncologist who specializes in integrative oncology, and he's been studying integrative oncology for 30 years. He treated Steve McQueen back in the 70s in Mexico. Um, he kind of picked the ball up, and he said, uh, with, with not, not himself solely, but one of the people, and he said, and he's been, He's been on the forefront of looking at integrative cancer models and working with patients looking to integrate conventional oncology with uh, integrative oncology, and he's an oncologist, so he was able to work in, in, in with both worlds. And he said, you know, wait a minute, let's take a, let's take a step back here. Well, we know the cancer cells are copper dependent. We know the trials didn't work out as well as we thought. Why didn't the trials work out as well as we thought? Well, maybe cancer cells, once their angiogenesis, their vascular architecture is already established, this doesn't work so hot. What if we take them to a point where they're treated, they have no evidence of disease, and then we use TM. And he's been doing this now for 13 years. He has a sample size of over 25 stage four patients. So stage four patients typically have a cancer recurrence within a year, usually, almost always two years. Um, and he has, uh, he's only had one patient recur of that 25. Just recently, it was a glioblastoma patient, a brain cancer patient, which is very, very difficult to treat. You take the glioblastoma patient out of the mix, he's got, a he's got a sample size now of 25 patients, stage four patients, not one reoccurrence, if he was able to meet the criteria that we need to meet, and we'll talk about that criteria. He has one woman who's now 13 years out. So uh, he says in the 30 years of practicing integrative oncology, this is by far the most impressive thing thing that he's seen. Um, so now, come along 2013, Cornell Medical Center, Linda Vidot, who, who uh, did earlier trials on glutamine, you'll see her name coming up in the glutamine trials in 2001, she's at Wild Cancer Center at Cornell, um, she got wind of this and said, hey, we need to study this. Let's take women who have a high risk of recurring, these are, st these are stage three and stage four breast cancer patients, Many who are triple negative, triple negative breast cancer patients tend to recur very, very quickly. No evidence of disease, we treated them, they're high likely to recur, let's do it, let's study this. 
Well, they studied that they have six years worth of data now. They just published a year's worth. It was published last year in the Annals of Oncology. They have 40 patients in that study, all stage three and stage four breast cancer patients. No evidence of disease. That's the key here. We got to get patients to a place where there's no evidence of disease for this to be effective. 75% were successfully decoppered, meaning they got ceruloplasmin levels, which is storage form of copper, under 17 milligrams. In our clinic, we're going for 8 to 12. So they didn't take it as low as we want to take it, what McKee recommends. And they only decoppered 75% of them, which means that they didn't kind of work as hard as we do with this. If, if we don't get our patients down, we just keep giving them more and more of this until we do. Um, what they noticed were there, there are precursors to VEGF or angiogenesis called EPCs, endothelial progenitor cells. There's another one called uh, hematopoietic progenitor cells. And they were able to show in their study these were significantly reduced in low copper patients. They had an 85% relapse free rate at 10 months. That doesn't sound that great, except that triple negative breast cancer patients, stage 3 and stage 4, on average relapse at 9 months. Um, I got more slides on the study than you want to see, but sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, this was big. We, we, you know, why this was so big is because we were doing this before the study came out, and oncologists used to look at us sideways. They were like, what are you, what are you talking about? You, 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 you doing tea, you're depleting copper as an anti-cancer? They thought we were completely out of our minds. So now that this is studied and published in the Alabama Oncology, it's really big, and like, oncologists can't like totally blow this off. Um, this was uh, uh, an anti-cancer an anti drug compound that disables the ability of the bone marrow cells from setting up a home in organs to receive and nurture migrating cancer tumor cells has shown su surprising benefit in one of the most difficult to treat forms of cancer, high-risk triple negative breast cancer patients. Um, it shows that patients at high risk of relapse with no current visible disease. That's the key here. It doesn't work. We'll use it sometimes. It actually works well in conjun conjunction with chemotherapy. But, and we'll use it with patients who have active disease, but we don't find that it works particularly well unless we get them to no evidence of disease. Our copper depleted, it results in a prolonged period of time with no cancer recurrence. Um, Vidot has said that we have, uh, uh, these study findings are very promising, potentially a very exciting advance in our efforts to help them convert at the highest of risk. She has data that says that they have some, they have five years of data now, so she says we actually have data that a few of our patients, says four of the study participants with a history of metastatic triple negative breast cancer, who tend to recur at nine months on average, have had long-term benefit remaining disease-free for between three and five and a half years. And again, they're not bringing the copper levels down as low as we do, or as what we keep recommends. Um, why do you think they, why do, we, why do you think that they don't bring it down that low? Uh, you potentially get more side effects, which we'll talk about. It's a little harder to manage. The anti-copper compound appears to be keeping tumors that want to spread in a dormant state. We believe one of the important ways it works is by affecting the tumor microenvironment. I don't think she's using that term. Specific to the bone marrow derived cells that are critical for metastasis progression. So this is really the first human trial we have that shows that copper chelation inhibits, and we know for a fact these EPCs, these um, endothelial progenitor cells, and HPCs, hematopoietic progenitor cells, which act as antiogenesis blockade. We're blocking antiogenesis from happening and keeping tumor in, in its dormancy. Um, so it was kind of cool. We didn't actually know this about the HPCs and the EPCs. The study actually has data that shows that women with the copper have lower levels of these, and these are major precursors to getting a cancer recurrence. Copper is critical to mobilizing these cells. Copper is essential to the metabolic metastatic process. It's a key component to enzymes that help turn on angiogenesis in the tumor microenvironment. Also, appears to play a role in directing cancer cell migration in the um, Side effects of TM. TM is not free lunch. It can cause anemia. The biggest uptake in the body are tumors. The second up, biggest uptake in the body of copper cells are bone marrow. Um, the same way that chemotherapy can cause bone marrow suppression, copper depletion can cause bone marrow suppression too. We need to actively monitor platelets, red blood cells, and particularly the white blood cells, especially the neutrophils. They're the ones that turn over the quickest. So if there's going to be a problem, so once anemic, it shows up in the white blood cells first. Some patients don't want to do this because we ask them to check their blood every other week usually. It's a lot of work. 
It's much the way patients who are on Coumadin have to check their INR regularly. Our patients check their blood every two weeks and they learn all about the, what they need to learn. I send them a spreadsheet and say you need to keep an eye on these numbers and then you need to email me when you get your labs back. My patients know really well exactly what they need to watch, exactly if their goat's too low, when they need to cut back on their TM. They become experts in this. And this is a team sport. I can't do it all myself. I have patients monitoring all the time. They need to learn how to do this themselves, and they can. Um, is there any long-term residual damage if someone goes anemic? None at all. It's completely transient. You take someone off TM, lower the dose, it completely reverses itself. There's no uh, damage that can happen long-term. There is some, you, you can get extremely anemic short-term if you're not watching this. So patients who get lazy, don't test their blood, I look fine, I'm going to wait a month, they can get themselves into big trouble. Um, we have to be really careful. We have some data that shows it helps to make chemotherapy more effective, particularly the anthracyclines, azomycin, um, and uh, uh, platinum medications, like solid platinum and carboplatinum. Um, we can use it with chemotherapy, but we have to be extremely careful because they're knocking the bone marrow down. We're knocking the bone marrow down if we get the ceruloplasm too low, so we, have, we don't have the same target as we do if you weren't on chemotherapy. We give a lower dose, and usually it's fine. Other avenues to lower copper, food. We will tell patients to avoid one unique shellfish, certain nuts and chocolate. Zinc helps to lower copper. We give patients 60 to 120 milligrams a day. You want to take it away from TM, because TM will co co uh, chelate copper also. And actually, uh, keeping a low stomach pH. So oftentimes we want to increase pH with most, we want to, um, Excuse me, I got this backwards. A low stomach pH, an acidic environment is what we're looking for with most of our patients, because most of the time people don't have enough stomach acid. With TM, actually the opposite it works better in a high pH. So sometimes we actually would um, put people on things like tri salts that help to buffer and will keep the pH uh, high, higher rather than lower. In an extreme case, we haven't ever done this before, and Dr. Hirsch will probably die before having to do this, but we could use acid blocking medication. If we, have, <laughs> if, we, if we have to. Copper chelation protocol, you gotta test it usually twice a month. If we're getting close to the target, it's even more frequently once a month. We're looking at the CBC, which is a complete blood count. We're looking at ceruloplasm levels. We're going for a target ceruloplasm, eight to 12. It takes three to five months to decopter the tumor cells, and we have had a fair number of patients have recurrence in a three to five month period which has gotten me very frustrated, particularly patients with ovarian cancer. We have two ovarian cancer patients recurring in a three to five month period where I couldn't get them to target level and they recurred. And it's gotten me to take a much less laissez-faire attitude with patients who have a high risk of recurrence. Um, one patient went on vacation to Mexico and I said, okay, just take a break, don't do it. She recurred, you know, four months after chemotherapy. So it's gotten me thinking, with patients who have a really high risk of recurrence, you've got to hit this hard. Because, because this, you know, you can get someone to the target of 8 to 12 in two months and they can recur three months later. So we got to get them to 8 to 12 months, then it takes three to five months to decopter the tumor cells, and then we stay at target for three years once you're NAD, no evidence of disease. And this is where, if you meet these criteria, you would fall into Dr. McKee's criteria where he's only seen one recurrence of a sample size of 25 patients, stage four patients, which is unbelievable. He hasn't published that data, but him and Brewer are working on writing those case reports after publishing that right now. Okay, so putting this all together, we're coming to, we're coming to the end here. Um, uh, uh, this is a, a nice chart that I'm very proud of putting together. Um, and this kind of puts all our lab steps together in the treatments we do. We look at stress, adrenal balance. Um, we're looking at DHEA and cortisol we talked about. These are the things that treat adaptogen nerves, sometimes using DHEA, sometimes using low dose hypercortisone, also known as cortap adrenal glandulars. For inflammation, we're looking, these are the labs we're looking at. CRP, IL-8, IL-6, TNF-alpha, fish oil, curcumin, boswellia, the like. Hypercoagulability, cancer cells like thick blood. We didn't talk about that today. But uh, cancer cells need thick blood to, to, to metastasize. They like it. So you'll notice we got, we're checking fibrinogen. We don't want it, um, that should say under rather than over. Uh, or, or it's a problem if it's over 325. I got it right, actually. We're also looking at a marker called D-dimer. If that's elevated, that's a problem. These are the keys we use to treat it. Lumbar kinase, which is an extract from earthworm. It's very expensive. They're very effective. Um, fibrinolytic herbs like bromelain, our friend curcumin, which shows up in just about everything. Fish oil helps stuff. Lower fibrinogen natokinase is a fibrinolytic uh, enzyme. Um, angiogenesis, which you've heard that word a gazillion times tonight, um, 
we're looking, like Dr. Hirsch talked about, if you see elevated copper, that's a bad sign for us. You know, boom, there's an angiogenesis process going on. Low zinc is a bad sign for us. We can check serum VEGF. That's a bad sign. I have a patient right now who's concerned she's recurring. I just checked the VEGF level. looks normal. I'm happy. It's good. Um, what do we use? We use TM. We just use zinc. Well, lignum can lower to some degree. And acetyl cysteine, alpha lipoic acid. Curcumin shows up in everything. Green tea, crystalline, resveratrol. Metabolic syndrome, huge with everything. And with someone who has a high cancer risk. Really important to keep your A1C under 5.4. You want to count HDL over 50. You want to make sure your leptin levels are under 13. Triglycerides, really important marker. Fasting glucose, um, adiponectin, and C peptide are two other ones that we get off of the HDL test we talked about earlier. Um, so, this is active surveillance, the bioterrain markers. Fasting insulin, it's over 10. That's a problem. Glycemic diet, these are the nutrients we use. Immune deficiency, we're looking at lymphocytes, natural killer cells sometimes. Medicinal mushroom shows up big in this one. Dr. Shannon just did a big talk on um, nutraceuticals to use with immune deficiency. And you spent a lot of time talking about mushrooms, right? Yeah. How um, can you not? Huh? How can you not? How can you not, right. Um, the baby's Coriolis is a ton of data out of Japan and uh, China with, uh, with thousands of patients about it. And it's considered an anti-cancer drug in Japan. We use that a lot. Um, the other babies are cordyceps and reishi. Uh, astragalus, a major immune modulating uh, herb, vitamins A, C, D, zinc. Nutritional deficiencies. We'll oftentimes test a spectrum cell micronutrient analysis. We also do Nutrivalve at Genova. We'll check the vitamin D levels, check the vitamin B12 levels, check the omega 3 levels, replete accordingly. Um, and then uh, methylation. Methylation is a really important metabolic process in the body that's involved in DNA expression. It's involved in, in uh, um, detoxification pathway, so we're checking a homocysteine level. It's got a sweet spot. We want it around 7, 8. If it's below 6 or greater than 8, it's both bad. Um, we're checking a 23 and me test to look at genetic polymorphism. There's a whole bunch of SNPs, like COMT, which is the one that I mentioned that I think shows up in a lot of hormonal dependent breast cancer patients. Um, we're fixing that with a lot of different types of B vitamins in particular. Imbalanced estrogen, we talked a lot about this. The 216 ratio, the 4 hydroxyestrone. We're looking at um, a marker called estrone sulfate, which your oncologists probably will test. It's a specialty estrogen level. We will oftentimes see elevated estrogens where we won't see it in other estrogen levels. Beta glucuronidase we pick up in the Genova test. It, uh, it's an indication that you're recycling toxins and uh, you're not excreting estrogen properly. And if we see that, what do we do? We customize treatment and these things like DM, calcium, D, glucurate, broccoli, seed extract, milk thistle. Oxidative stress, these are the labs we look at. We talked a lot about how to treat it. Putting it all together now, everybody should have an anti-inflammatory diet, a low glycemic diet, eating nutrient-dense bioactive foods, nine servings a day of all the, of the uh, fruits and vegetables we talked about. Proactive monitoring of the bioterrain labs that we've been talking about. You need to work with a clinician who's doing these functional medicine labs and who's monitoring these not you know, uh, it's great to have a mammogram to see if cancer is going in for early detection. It's great to look at tumor markers. Those are awesome. But those are not prevention. What I love about these things is that we can pick up cancers before they're actually active. If I see an elevated um, uh, 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 fibrinogen level, if I see an elevated CRP level, I'm going to be on it. You know, I'm not letting that thing hang around. That to me is a sign that we got a problem, we got something brewing under the surface. So if I need to use, I'm going to put someone on Celebrex. I'm going to get them on a pharmaceutical. We use a lot of metformin in our clinic because besides the fact that it helps to lower um, insulin levels, it helps lower blood sugar levels, it has major anti-cancer properties. It helps to inhibit a major cancer pathway called mTOR. So, you know, we're not bashful about using pharmaceuticals. When we see these terrain levels come up, that's a, the red light is flashing for us. Like, we got to get this down, we got to get it down now. Regular physical exercise, of course, adequate rest, stress reduction techniques with that stress reduction. I think everyone should be taking adaptive nerves to help us adapt to stress. We have to optimize body fat. Um, levels. It's a good idea to think about these multitasking herbs and spices. Curcumin, 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 green tea, reserve, thyme, right? Now, rosemary, ginger, cloves. They're awesome. Curcumin, um, like Miami, you recommend? Uh, there's a lot of debate about that. Um, uh, there's a lot of debate about that. Uh, it comes in many different forms. There's not a lot of consensus. Um, there's some forms that get into the bloodstream faster, and a lot of those folks say, oh, use ours because we have data showing it goes in the bloodstream faster. Dr. Agarwal, who's the most respected authority on this, says, well, 
I don't even care how quickly it gets in the bloodstream because it actually doesn't affect tissue uptake what's in the bloodstream. I'm concerned about tissue up uptake. So, so a lot of companies are binding it to a phospholipid and say it gets in the bloodstream faster. We don't really know. Donnie, uh, who, who, who Donnie Ann spends an hour and a half looking at clinical data 365 days a year, so I usually defer to him on questions like this, and he really likes, um, he likes combining curcumin with uh, piperine, which is the type of black pepper. He feels like that's yeah, the best, uh, that's the best way. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what he puts into his problems. Um, uh, but you know, really, you know, you got a treasure trove in your house that herbs and spices really work on. High levels of dietary crucifers, we've got a lot of good data on crucifers vegetables having anti-cancer properties. Make sure your, your micronutrients are maximized, including, especially vitamin D, zinc, iodine, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, and antioxidants. Optimal omega-3 to 6 ratios. Um, and herbs and nutrients that enhance detoxification pathways like curcumin, methylated B vitamins to help with methylation, green tea, broccoli, sea extract, milk thistle, or pork acid, and root veggies. Is cumin and curcumin or Two different things. They're both great. <laughs> turmeric. Um, so curcumin is an extract from turmeric. So in your spice chest, it's going to be turmeric. Turmeric. Okay. I kept this in. I had like 20 slides on toxins. And I had to get them out of there because the top was too long. But I put left one in here on reducing your toxin load. You know, the, the data between toxic exposure and cancer is huge. Um, doing the infrared saunas is like the best thing I can think of to help reducing the toxic load. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, it's awesome. So if you have any opportunity to do saunas to get out fat soluble toxins, it's like the best thing you can do for yourself. And doing um, regular cleanses. Um, we just did a cleanse here at the clinic, uh, a 21 day cleanse. We usually do it once a year, twice a year. Yeah. And then, uh, and we're done. Questions? This is just some resources. These are supplements that we oftentimes use. Um, these are the functional labs that we tend to use. These are some uh, environmental research that are worth looking up. The environmental working group should be on here, but it's not. Breast Cancer Fund is awesome. They put out something called uh, State of the Evidence, which is the scientific link between breast cancer and environmental toxins. And the link is just astronomical. They, they give you all the data. They, it's a great, great organization. Yeah, and I think that that's, um you know, what they're pointing to and what you've talked about is that we all need to be detoxifying. We, all, we live in a really toxic world. It's not something anyone can avoid. Yeah. So a regular sauna versus your infrared one? It's better than nothing. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can, can one um, detoxify too much? Can one go on too many cleanses throughout the year? Yes. Okay, so what would be a normal, well, would be have a good balance? Um, well, I think that, um, I mean, I'm an advocate of perhaps fasting every month um, and maybe doing prolonged fasts and other cleanses um, every quarter. So I think that can be helpful, but a lot of it has to do with your day-to-day, -day, you know, like what sort of toxins are you exposed to? Those things can help remediate those things, but um, you just have to be really conscious about the food, the items that you're putting into your body, the plastic exposures, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I would say I, I, uh, I, I like to do a fast for myself at least once a year, a cleanse at least once a year, which I start off with a fast. Um, and, uh, you know, if you, can, if you have access to regular sauna use, it's a great thing. What was the name of the book that you're employing now as far as food and talk to food sensitivity? The Plan by Lynn Jeanette. L Y M G Y N E T. If you Google, you get her blog. Her blog is uh, uh, lynnjeanette.com or something like that. When you put in the plan, Lynn, it'll pop up. So you said that, that you didn't think that there were any good tests to find food uh, sensitivities? I did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I just spoke to Lynn Jeanette about this, actually, because like, I talked to her the other day, and I said, what, what's your opinion on them? And she said, uh, people bring them to me all the time, and I'd say they're about 50% accurate. If I could find one that's 80% accurate, I'd be totally psyched. What about the MRT test? Uh, yeah, yeah, the MRT is the one that treats me the most. Um, and the people who like me the most are the people who get the MRT. Um, yeah, I, I think that's probably true. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but I think people who like the MRT rave about it. Um, I did the MRT test on my son and wasn't particularly impressed with what I found. Um, uh, colleagues of mine who do MRT swear by it. There's some people out there who say they get huge change 
and MRT finds weird stuff, like lettuce will come up on some people. Um, and, 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 and yeah, so the proponents of MRT will go to their graves telling you that it is, it is, it's the way to go. I'm not convinced, and at $350 a test, I can't, have, I can't really afford to tell my patients to, to experiment with it. Um, when I asked Lynn this question, when I spoke to her, I spoke to her yesterday, actually, she said, this is what she said to me. She said, yeah, I spoke to one of those the other day, and some of it was wrong based on my data. Her data is based on weighing yourself every morning, and when you gain weight, you eat your food that you're sensitive to, and if you lose weight, you have it, and if you're in your optimal weight, you should stay there. So she uses the scale as her measurement, but she uses other tools as well. She uses diabetics, she uses blood sugar monitoring, she'll use basal body temperature. So I, I so I I, I, I just lost um, so 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 I'm really interested. I just did a 21 day detox, standard process detox, and was on a pristine diet for 21 days and lost three or four pounds. And then I decided rather than reintroducing foods, the basic foods that we all learn about in in the reintroduction phase, the dairy, corn, eggs, soy, wheat, and the like, I was going to do her plan. because patient line was telling me about it. I was I, I thought I should have lost more weight during the 21 days. 